week. Yeah. I'm Rabbi Barbara Penzner of Temple Hill B'nai Torah. It is a great honor and um, a joy today, particularly in this time, to have the opportunity to celebrate this annual lecture in memory of Alan Waters, Zichrono Livracha, and to have a very special guest today as our speaker. And I'm going to introduce the people who are going to speak. And in addition, I want to introduce two people who are not with us in the room. So first, Alan Waters was a beloved member of our community, but beloved most of all to Paula. And after he died of cancer in 2005, she made a point of celebrating him and his passion for Jewish learning by creating the Alan J. Waters Memorial Lecture, which began in 2006. And every year we have had a fascinating speaker from a whole variety of perspectives and on different issues. Paula, in her own right, should be introduced as a founding member of Our Bodies Ourselves. And I don't have my original Our Bodies Ourselves, but I do have a book that she also worked on, Ourselves Growing Older, which is an important book for today's talk. And she um, is now working on a memoir of her youth as the daughter of immigrants and how that circumstance led to her participation in social justice movements and um, the founding of Our Bodies Ourselves. And when, before Paula speaks, I also want to introduce our other speakers. So we are delighted to have one of the most esteemed rabbis in the country today, Rabbi Laura Geller, who is the author of the book that I know a number of you were talking about already. It builds in a way on what um, Paula did. It's getting good at getting older. So we have a through line from Paula's book to Laura's book that we're gonna be hearing about today. And I've had the great privilege of getting to know Rabbi Geller as we have been mentors to rabbis through the CLE program, um, Clergy Leadership Incubator. And she is retired as Rabbi Emerita of Temple Emmanuel of Beverly Hills. She um, served after being director of Hillel at the University of Southern California. She was the Pacific Southwest region's executive director of American Jewish Congress for four years. And um, she is one of the foremost rabbis, as I said, she was the third woman in the reform movement to become a rabbi. And as such, she is a mentor to me. Um, there are many other publications that she's been involved in, including being on the editorial board of the Torah, a women's commentary, which I refer to on a regular basis. The second person I wanna bring into the room who isn't here is her co-author of Getting Good and Getting Older. And that's um, her husband, Zichron Ali Vracha, Richard Siegel, who many of you may remember as a co-editor of the Jewish catalog. And when she and Richard decided to start thinking about um, this book, it was an idea of creating a Jewish catalog for people who are aging. So we have these wonderful resources that have all come together in this moment for those of us who are in a place of aging and looking forward to it, we hope, and hoping to age. Um, with joy and with gratitude and with tools to be able to withstand whatever comes our way as we age. Finally, having introduced Paula and Rabbi Geller and Richard Siegel, who unfortunately passed away before the book came out, I wanna introduce the person who's going to be interviewing Rabbi Geller so that this is more of a conversation. And that's a longtime member, Heidi Brown, who is a teacher of English as a second language. And she was former owner of Heidi Brown Communications and former director of communications at Tufts University. And we were so grateful that Heidi agreed 
to participate today in this process. So now I'm going to pass this over to Paula, who wants to say a few more words about Alan, particularly in his last year. Paula. Uh, all right, I'm going to read um, what I wrote so that I don't forget any of it. Um, and I also changed the, um, the beginning because I wanted to uh, make it, it turned out that it's really mostly about 2005 because the year before other things were going on and, um, and it turned, you know, as it turned out, you'll, you'll hear uh, the, uh, what happened there. So I'm honored to have the opportunity to celebrate Alan on his birthday. And I thank you all for being here. I've been reflecting especially on our last months together because I don't have as clear a memory of the prior year, except that our friends were visiting us so that we did not have to go visit them. I've been reflecting on how fully and vigorously Alan lived until the end. Alan was determined to make he was still able. Early in January, we set out for theater in New York, but first we headed for Cape Cod, where a cousin of Alan's had succumbed to cancer. We tried not to think of the parallels in their lives, the divorces and second marriages that prompted the other cousins to seat us together at family gatherings, despite any bond of common interest or rapport. We focused instead on comforting the mourners, Alan, the survivor, the two of us still the happy couple, bon vivants, reading theater reviews, going on jaunts here and there. We went on to our hotel in Manhattan, then headed for the theater where we met up with Alan's older cousin, Marvin, also a theater buff, and saw the first show of our play, Democracy, a stirring drama about East Germany. Marvy taught German part-time at Barnard, so I was especially interested in the first play. Um, he had arranged a favorite dinner place where we praised the great food and talked about uh, the play we had seen together. We joked a little bit about getting um, Marvy to join us um, at uh, the, our second play, Wicked, um, but he was not interested in that. He uh, preferred to nurse his martini and chat up the waitress. We went on to the next theater, challenging the freezing weather, the cabs that wouldn't stop. Still, we were happy. We loved our, we found our way to the theater where the lobby was crowded with teenage girls excited about a new play they felt was designed for them. Alan, typically grouchy about musicals that had no substance, was pleasantly surprised. He loved it. We both loved it. Next event, Passover at our house in Newton. Remembering two years past when Alan got his diagnosis of esophageal cancer. This was the next phase uh, when we got more bad news. Our Seder friends arrived early to set up and welcomed us when we arrived, thanked us for our hospitality for all the seders we had held at our home. Alan tried to move on into the seder, but our friends insisted that he had to listen to their praise. <laughs> and, uh, and then we had the seder. So <clears throat> next item, um, May 2005 was my son Ben's 36th birthday. We made an occasion out of it the two times high symbolism of 36 and held a retrospective going back to Ben's high school artwork, then photographs and paintings from the museum school at the MFA. Alan was still fit and strong enough to hang Ben's paintings and alert enough to set up a bookkeeping system and preside over sales during the open house. One of the best ever, I have to say. Um, then uh, came Memorial Weekend in Connecticut with Alan's daughter Susie and her family and his son David up from North Carolina and the children running about while we sat in the sun. In 
in July, Alan was keen on a trip to Bryce Canyon because he had never been there. Our friend Wendy, who's here this evening, um, also of Oboth, uh, she um, was concerned that it was too strenuous for Alan's condition. I agreed and Alan complied. Instead, we traveled to California to visit Hannah and Emily. Alan saw their baby, A.B., one more time. Hannah was so supportive helping Alan up the stairs of our second floor room at the Fairfax b, &B. August, getting the house ready for a chamber concert we had bid on and won, quote unquote, <laughs> to benefit the Boston Youth Symphony where Alan was on the board. A parent of one of the children had some experience as a chef, but this project was not selling. I was concerned that Alan would be disappointed. So three of us, Judy Narsijan from uh, Obos and uh, also active in music, uh, BYSO, Linda, our next door neighbor, and I each put in $200 each to make the minimum bid of $600. By then, Alan knew his energy was winding down, but I didn't get it when he kept saying he wouldn't be there. I kept urging that he had put so much time into this project. He had created this project. How could he not be there? But before the end of August, uh, and August 25th, two days before my August 27th birthday, he was gone. And so in the months after Alan's death, I kept occupied by responding to temple members and family members and friends who sent regrets about the loss of, loss of Alan. And after a morning of that, I couldn't eat any lunch. So I would go upstairs for a nap. During one of those naps, the particular one, um, I felt a gentle touch on my cheek and felt Alan had magically disappeared through the closed window. It was that dream that freed me to move on into the world of the living. And most of all, I appreciated Rabbi Barbara taking me on the widow's walk when I think when all this was passed. That's it. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for bringing back his memory for all of us. Uh, he was so dear and we miss him. Not as, probably not as often as you, but we definitely miss him and he's, we hold him in our hearts. And I'm grateful to know that you have members of your family, particularly Hannah, who's been helpful, who's on today. I could say a lot more about you. I could say a lot more about our speakers, but right now, love to open up our program and I'm going to turn it over to Heidi Brown. We're going to mute. Okay. And I'm going to unmute. So hello, everybody. I'm very honored to be here as well. And um, I just want to say also that I'm really glad that I agreed to do this interview because I learned so much from reading this book, Getting Good at Getting Older. And I know that um, some of the people on this call are already familiar with you, uh, Rabbi Geller, through your late husband, Richard Siegel's work, The Jewish Catalog. And that book was published in 1973 and it's still in print. And having worked in publishing, I know that that's a huge accomplishment and a testament to the value of that book. And I'm just wondering, was getting good at getting older a natural outgrowth of, of that book? And how did you come to write this one? So before I answer that question, I wanna begin by thanking Paula for this Alan J. Wirtz's Memorial Lecture. Though I didn't know Alan, I really wish I had. He and my late husband, Rich, the co-author of Getting Good at Getting Older had so much in common, curiosity, love of learning and courage. Both died too young but how they live their lives and face their illness remains inspirational to all of us who hear their stories. Rabbi Penzner shared with me the Devar Torah that Alan gave at his adult bar mitzvah. I was so very moved by the wisdom and the courage that it displayed. And 
Paul, I look forward to getting to know you because that book that you were a part of, Our Bodies, Ourselves, was like a Bible to my generation. And when I read and reread with my daughter from when she was a young girl. And I'm particularly grateful to Rabbi Pinsner, my colleague and friend, for inviting me into this congregation and Heidi for connecting me with you. Between wanting to someday meet Paula and Heidi face to face, I can't wait until it's safe to actually come to Boston. So to your question, was getting good at getting older a natural outgrowth of Rich's book, The Jewish Catalog? And the answer is absolutely yes. You all know that uh, when he was young in the late 60s and 70s, he was a leader in the Jewish counterculture. He actually lived in the Chavarat Shalom in Somerville, the very first Chavara. And the true origin story of the Jewish catalog is there are these Jewish guys who are living together in this Chavara in Somerville. And the reason they were all guys at the time, first of all, it was in the early uh, um, 70s. And it actually was a seminary because people wanted to get out of the draft. And one of the ways to do it was to be part of a seminary. So the Chavarat Shalom initially was a seminary, hence it was all men. Um, and apparently uh, there was a book at that time called The Whole Earth Catalog. And that was an important um, part of the culture of the time. So it turns out that the first Sukkot in the Chavarat Shalom, these guys, these Jewish guys go out to the backyard to build a sukkah for the first time. And of course, none of them knew which way to hold a hammer. And one of them actually said, whoa, there should be a whole earth catalog that would teach us how to build a sukkah. So that was how the Jewish catalog started. Um, it offered the tools to take responsibility for our own Jewish lives, the first do-it-yourself catalog. Some of you might even have used the challah recipe in this catalog, the first time you ever tried to bake challah. So that was the 60s and 70s. And now many of us are in our 60s and 70s. And we need another do-it-yourself kit to help us navigate the changes that are part of our lives as we grow older. So that's the first reason why Rich and I wrote this book. But the second is, began as uh, I was approaching retirement, I was 62, and beginning to think about our next stage. And I noticed that a huge percentage of our congregants were boomers. Many were leaving the congregation. And that observation led to a listening campaign where we met with 250 congregants in groups in people's homes. And we asked them how they feel about this stage of their life, the stage between maturity, building families and careers, and frail old age. And it turns out that this is actually a new stage of life, one that didn't exist for our grandparents. We're all now living approximately 30 years longer than people were a century ago, thanks to advances in medicine, education, and science. And these years are not tacked on to the end of our lives, but in the middle, between midlife and frail old age, a whole stage of life that our grandparents never experienced. So in this listening campaign, we asked, what do you want in those extra years? What keeps you up at night? What gets you up in the morning? And we asked people, what do you call this new stage? What do you call yourself? And we learned how hard it is to name this stage. So I'm gonna ask you to think about this and maybe put some of your responses in the chat. Do you wanna be called a boomer? Well, technically boomers are people who were born between 1946 and 1964. So some of us are boomers, some of us aren't. Do you like to be called senior? Some people like the, uh, in the olden days when we could go to the movies and we get those senior discounts, right? But uh, some people don't like the word. Retired, not all of us worked. Rewired, seasoned, elder, the third chapter, the encore generation, the important thing for us to notice is that this stage is not just about boomers. What we're actually doing is creating a new life stage that didn't exist before. And someday our millennial children or grandchildren will be in this stage. So 
what are we and how do we want to be called? The name that I like the best is Perennial, named by Dr. Laura Carsonson from Stanford. You know, some years you bloom, some years you don't, but you're still fruitful and you're still um, engaged in the world. And, and one other point about it, it's not a chronological age, but a life stage. Some of us in this life stage are healthy and very active. Others wrestle with physical challenges, illness, caregiving. Some of us are parents of adult children, uh, grandchildren. Some of us don't have children or grandchildren. Some of us have partners, some of us are alone. We're a very mixed multitude. But I think what we have in common is wanting to get good at getting older. Yeah, I think that's great. I love the idea of us perennially blooming. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely image. And I have to be honest, when I first heard the name of the book, I was a little leery of delving into the topic. And I feel like Americans are especially reluctant to talk about and to face death and aging. I think our, you know, as someone who has studied language, our language is filled with euphemisms for these subjects. I found that even at 90, my father preferred to think of himself as older rather than old. So I'm just curious, how do you think our unwillingness to acknowledge our mortality affects us for better or worse? Well, the truth is that we live in a world where there is a lot of ageism, right? It's not so easy to be growing older in a world that, um, you know, values youth and doesn't seem to value age. Um, that's a serious problem, but an even more serious problem is internalized ageism. These stereotypes that we carry ourselves about what it means to get older. I think that a lot of this is beginning to change because of the pandemic. All of us who pretended that 70 was the new 50. It's not true because we all know now that anybody over 60 can go to Trader Joe's or Whole Foods and shop between seven and eight in the morning because we are in a vulnerable category. So we can't pretend anymore. And the fear of growing older that has to do with becoming dependent, I think the pandemic has taught all of us that we are all Nobody is independent. The trick is to try to understand a kind of nurturing interdependence. And I think as we get that right, issues around growing older will become less terrifying. The danger of not being willing to acknowledge mortality, that there's less time ahead than there was behind, means that we're going to miss the opportunity to find ways to create purpose and meaning. And I really do think that confronting mortality doesn't have to be depressing. The mm -hmm. real danger of denial, the unwillingness to talk about the truth that we will die, is that we will avoid those important conversations that we must be having with our loved ones about end of life issues. The book is a toolkit and in it, there's an article by the folks that brought us the conversation project that actually script how you have that difficult conversation about end of life issues. And if you don't have it, there may well come a time when you no longer are able to communicate what you want and your loved ones or your adult children, if you have them, are in the hospital room fighting with each other about what you want. And that leads to incredible toxicity. So the unwillingness to face the fact that as far as I know, the death rate is still holding at 100% means that you miss out on a lot of very important dimensions of life. Mm, that's, that's really poignant. And, you know, I was thinking we can talk a lot about the pandemic and how that um, has changed things for us. Obviously, you wrote the book before the pandemic. So, um, you know, there are some things that are translatable and, and some that aren't. But I want to go back to this um, point that you make about communication, conversation, planning ahead, 
because I think that's something that many of us struggle with every day. We, we some, some of us struggle with procrastination, but again, because of this resistance or denialism regarding aging, um, we particularly avoid certain kinds of planning. We're certainly told that we need to plan financially for our retirement, but if we think about um, the important conversations, the important planning, there's so much more than um, a, to our legacy that's unrelated to our financial and our physical belongings. When we think, for example, about writing our wills. And in your book, you describe different ways that people can align the values that they wanna pass on to future generations, including letters, videos, and even philanthropy. How um, can we leave a lasting testament with our family, the communities, and the nonprofits that we care about? So one of the things I think that does characterize this uh, stage of our life is thinking about our legacy. Um, and the question is, not only how do we leave a legacy, but how do we live a legacy? So the book actually talks about four different categories of what we leave behind. We leave behind money. Some of us have a lot of money. Some of us don't have a lot of money, but all of us as Jews give tzedakah. What do we teach by how we think about our money? It's interesting that in writing the book, uh, we um, solicited an article about um, thoughtful philanthropy and what it means to have a strategic plan. And it's an article that anybody who has any money to give away, whether it's a lot of money or not a lot, you know, might want to think about. And Andres uh, Spokini, who is the head of the Jewish Funders Network, wrote the article. And we actually had a fight with our publishers about using the word philanthropy, because for them, the word meant rich people. But for us, the word meant people who are thoughtful about money. When Rich and I began to talk about our end of life wishes, we divided our estate such as it will be. He had two children, I have two children, we're a blended family. And we decided to leave our estate, our money in five categories, one for each of the children and one for the children together to decide how to give away. That was an important thing for us. The kids didn't grow up together. We married later in life. But the idea of them together thinking through how to give this money away meant that they would be connected to each other. So the thoughtful planning around philanthropy was not only about how our money might be distributed, but how to keep our family together. So money is one of the issues. The next issue is stuff. So I have bad news for all of you. Our children don't want our stuff. Mm -hmm. So what do we do with that stuff? And that becomes pretty important. You know, my grandmother's hutch is the one thing that got shipped from Boston out to uh, Los Angeles. And every time I look at it, I remember her and the family. And, uh, and it's sad to me that none of my kids are going to want it. But I want my children to know the story. I want my children to know my grandmother, although she's long gone. Um, so one of the things that one can do with the stuff that our kids don't want is that we photograph those things and we write down the story about them or we walk through our house with our children and share those stories so that while the stuff might not end up in my children's home, the what that um, means, what those things mean. And there's a very powerful article about um, thinking about how to do that and how to make sure that those stories get communicated. Actually, I love, sorry to interrupt, but you, you have a, a way with words that's very um, eloquent, saying very uh, briefly, leave a legacy, not a landfill. Right, leave a legacy, not a landfill, right. <laughs> The third area is um, our stories. How do we leave those stories um, behind? And um, one of the ways is to um, do a video conversation with uh, um, people that, you know, older people that you care about, or at some point it'll be us, you know, and, and uh, how do you do that? Um, there's a lot of technology out there. So there's an article that actually talks about how you do that. 
um, what technology you need, what kinds of questions to ask, et cetera. And then finally, there's the issue of values. How do we leave values? And Jewish tradition actually offers us an incredible tool called an ethical will that um, you know, begins in the Bible when uh, Jacob blesses his sons, um, each one of them with a different blessing. Um, and throughout Jewish tradition, from the biblical period to the rabbinic period to the medieval period to the modern period, Jews have been writing ethical wills. Uh, very interested in literature, uh, wonderful books about it. Uh, there's a, in the tools and resources section, you know, there's a bibliography. But uh, what would it mean to you to think about leaving an ethical will where you articulate your values and how you understand what your life meant um, to whomever is your audience. Now, some of us have children and grandchildren and they're our audience. Others of us have friends or a community or a um, um, nonprofit that we were connected to. So who the audience is, is an important question and how you think about your own life and, and the idea of um, harvesting the wisdom of our lives as we um, try to articulate it either in a written ethical will or in a videoed ethical will become an important part of, of thinking about what it means to get good at getting old. Hmm. I was um, particularly happy to see that you had an entry from Sylvia Borstein the Jewish Buddhist and author of many books, including, that's funny, you don't look Buddhist. <laughs> um, I became a fan of Sylvia Borstein after listening to an interview of her in which she said something like, people think I possess the most profound equanimity, but I tell them I am always two words away from losing it completely. What are those two words? First, you have to imagine the phone ringing and a voice says, Hello, Ma, <laughs> and it doesn't sound right. I'm sure many of us can relate to that. And those of us who have had kids, um, one of the things that, that we work on now is our relationships with our adult children. You describe a good relationship as striking the right balance between nurturing and autonomy. What can we do to foster a positive, mature relationship with our adult children without falling into the usual traps? Okay, so this is a really important issue. And the person that wrote that article is a uh, person that many of you might know, Ruth Nemzoff. Um, she wrote an important book called Don't Bite Your Tongue, How to Foster Rewarding Relationships with Your Adult Children. So she has that chapter in our book. She uh, is, uh, lives in Brookline and uh, was connected to Brandeis for many years. And I suspect she's friends with some of you. Um, this is important because uh, for those of us who have children, because getting it right helps both sides experience the pleasure of genuine interdependence. It's difficult, you know, uh, and again, the pandemic is raising this question in a really, uh, you know, powerful way because um, many of us have adult children who've moved back home with us and many of us and then some of them have brought their grandchildren and how do you have a good relationship with these adults who once were children? Um, what um, Dr. Nemzoff challenges us to see our adult children as adults and to acknowledge as we see them as adults our own aging and to find ways not to replace some of the old tapes that might have been appropriate at an earlier stage in everybody's life, but maybe aren't so uh, appropriate anymore. Um, when we really acknowledge our children as adults, part of what's difficult about that is that we have to acknowledge that we are older adults and given the denial that we spoke about at the beginning, that becomes very complicated. So the article that, uh, that Ruth wrote in the book, it gives you very specific tools to talk about what the rules should be as um, you know, these adult children come home and the complicated relationships we have with adult children, whether they're living with us or not. Those of us who do have grandchildren, for example, what is the relationship to the grandchildren's parents, right? 
it's not always wonderful. And how do you negotiate the truth that sometimes we're not as connected to our children and grandchildren as some of us might like? What are the ways to deal with that? Who are the people that are on your team to help you pay attention to the messages that you're communicating that maybe you don't intentionally want to communicate? The other thing that, um, that happens as we grow older is that there's a chapter on honoring parents. And when we wrote the chapter, we were thinking about honoring our parents. My mother is still alive. She lives in uh, um, Newbridge on the Charles nearby, some of you. Um, honoring our parents was always about honoring my mom and dad, but now I am one of those parents. And what does it mean for me to be honored by my children? What's reasonable, what's not reasonable, what the expectations ought to be? Um, how do I communicate in a way that is open and honest without being uh, intrusive. I mean, these are all challenges of this stage of um, growing older. In our listening campaign, one of the things that kept coming up is how relationships change as we grow older. Relationships with our adult children, if we have them, relationships with our aging parents, if we have them, and particularly relationships with friends and how friendship changes mm. as we get older. And that became a very important piece of um, what we learned. And, um, and hence there's a chapter about, you know, making friends and letting go of toxic friendships and, um, you know, how, what we need in friendship, how it might've changed from the days that we drove carpool with people. And now, uh, you know, I'm retired and my social network has, constricted and my need for friendship is um, you know more acute or differently acute. Um, we found a, a turns out that Betty Friedan wrote a book in um, 1993 um, called uh, um, the age. called the Fountain of Age and in it she said more and more psychologists have found that for older persons, Loneliness is not necessarily linked to the death of a spouse or to how infrequently they see their children or grandchildren, but to the absence of personal relationships with peers, friends of their own age or any age who share their interests hmm. and with whom they sustain their roots of shared experience. So that's something that was a surprise, but turns out to be really, really important as we think about what it means to get good at getting older. Right. And, you know, um, there was a statistic in the book and you, I'm not sure exactly what the percentage was, but that loneliness can be a greater risk factor for mortality than obesity or smoking. Right. And, you know, that's, that's a really, um, you know, important thing for all of us to remember and how it is, how important it is to stay connected. And I was thinking that, um, when you talk about friendships and expanding your friendship circle, somebody had mentioned earlier uh, to me as we were preparing for this that, you know, when family moves away or becomes more remote, that that friends can take on a new, right. um, a new magnitude, a new importance. And um, a number of years ago, I worked at a university as uh, Rabbi Pensner mentioned. And I developed friendships there with colleagues who were 20 and 30 years younger. And these relationships were really gratifying. I felt they gave me a window into an entirely different universe. And um, in the book, you talk about intentionally cultivating young friends, uh, partly as a way to make getting older easier as we need more help. So can you share with us some suggestions for creating this kind of intergenerational community and for building community in general as we age? So, uh, you know, in, in one of the short uh, takeaways about getting good at getting older is cultivating younger friends, right? Um, and uh, how do you do that? First of all, you recognize that you are worthy of friendship. In other words, you have much to give um, to people of all generations, not just for people of our generation, but for people who are older than we and people who are younger than we are. And then you're very intentional about cultivating younger friends. So I have a friend in Jerusalem who um, uh, they're kind of interviewing people 
this is before the pandemic, interviewing people to be their younger friends. So they would intentionally invite people from their show home for Shabbos lunch and uh, try to get to know them. And the people, the candidates didn't know that they were being interviewed, but my friends were intentional about uh, who are the people that there was a connection with and how could they develop those connections. And, uh, um, you know, I, I mean, I think that there actually are strategies and some of them are, are uh, specified in the book. Um, the, the notion of intergenerational community, I wanna say something about a synagogue. Synagogues are one of the few institutions that are left in our um, you know, society that are genuinely multi-generational. And how could the synagogue pay more attention to the possibilities of creating multi-generational connections? You know, Judaism speaks about Lador Vador, from generation to generation. And there's this sense that it's one way, that it flows from my wisdom to a younger generation. But in fact, I think the real truth is that it's Dor Vador, generations with generations. How do we find ways to create the kinds of programs where older folks and younger folks do stuff together? I think that this political moment has become an opportunity. Uh, I'm sure that you, like we, are doing a lot of phone banking and texting and, you know, and to do that in an intergenerational setting is really an opportunity to make new friends and to learn to listen to younger people and their understandings of the world. Um, so part of it is to recognize that this is important and to be intentional about doing it and then to look for some tools that can help you do it. Mm. Yeah, that sounds right. And um, back a little bit to this notion of the legacy and, and um, will, there was a comment that many parents um, spend twice as much money on their adult children um, as they do contributing to their retirement accounts. but you know, we are regularly bombarded with messages about financial planning, whether it's from banks or our workplaces, uh, but there are very few guidelines for how to prepare for the personal changes that we experience uh, during retirement. And you describe it as an important time for discovery and renewal. So how do you think retirement has changed and why is it important to plan for it beyond financially? Well, first of all, retirement has changed because we're living a whole lot longer, right? Um, so grandparents, if they worked, you know, after retirement, I mean, I grew up in Boston, they moved to Florida, they played golf and then they died. Um, there wasn't a stage there in between. But now, you know, if all of us have, or many of us will have 30, 35 years, if, you know, there's a possibility we're living to 100, you know, there's a big chunk of time when we're no longer working full time. And therefore it's important to plan for it, not just financially, but also spiritually and in terms of the kinds of communities we create. Um, uh, when we did the listening campaign, we discovered that there were four fears that people had. The first fear was becoming invisible the second becoming isolated, the third was being without purpose, and the fourth was becoming dependent. So retirement for a lot of us raises issue of invisibility. Who am I when I'm no longer the senior rabbi of Temple Emanuel of Beverly Hills? Who are you when you're no longer, you know, running your, um, the, the publishing work that you did before. How do people see who you are? Um, if you've moved to a different community and people don't know your story, how do they know who you were before you came to live in Boston? Um, so visibility becomes really important. Um, and with that, how do I fill my life with purpose? Um, there's a word that we use in the book called ikigai which is a Japanese word for the purpose for which you wake up in the morning. What is the purpose 
for which you wake up in the morning when you're no longer going to work? That becomes an incredibly important question. And you don't have to answer it right away, but you have to think about it. Um, you want to explore an encore career. Do you want to try to find meaningful ways to give back? Um, Erickson, the you know, social psychologist, sees this stage of our life as one of generativity. How do we be generative at this stage of our life? These are all things that are important to think about. And there's a section in the book about um, um, finding purpose. Uh, I just want to read uh, one quick section from it. This is from an article by Mark Friedman and Marcy Albahor from Encore.org. Life after 50 is a distinct period with its own character. We become more empathetic. We get better at synthesizing ideas at making connections between disparate elements and solving complex problems. We actually grow smarter in some ways. There are good reasons wisdom is linked with age. Millions today are trading the old dream of freedom from work and the attendant social isolation in retirement to put this wisdom to use in encore roles, productive engagements that contribute to the greater good. Purpose is an animating force in this season. People seek work that speaks to issues beyond personal ambition and address pressing social challenges. The truth is society needs us, the more experienced segment of our population, particularly as our country faces serious challenges in areas such as education, health, social services, and the environment. The Encore movement can help turn this all around and it can do so on a grand scale, delivering the biggest potential human capital windfall since women entered the workforce en masse two generations ago. Today's Encore pioneers are at the vanguard of a permanent change. We are the first wave charting a new path beyond the golden years cliche. But still, finding our way to an encore is neither quick nor easy. And then the article talks about some of the questions that you need to ask yourself and other people as you begin to think about where will you find purpose in this stage of your life? Mm. And that's why I love uh, your term rewirement, because I do think that that's required of us. Uh, as we uh, let go of certain purposes and, and create new ones. And, um, you know, another thing that I think you spoke movingly about and that I found really interesting was uh, ritual and the importance of ritual in our lives. There's a story in Getting Good at Getting Older about how friends organized a virtual cottage for Rabbi Rachel Cowan, in which they each signed up for specific days to say cottage in her memory. And for me, that story was a reminder that we're always creating new rituals as times change. So now, um, in, in this time of COVID, many of us have attended a virtual funeral, shiva, or even a wedding. And uh, these particular rituals have always depended on community. So how do we mourn and celebrate during a time that requires us to be distant? Um, and you know, any other wisdom that you have um, in this book for us as we're all struggling to maintain community while we need to protect our health and the health of others. And then, you know, not to throw <laughs> too much at you, but the, the topic of ritual, I think is obviously there's a, a whole book in that, um, but I'd, I'd love for you to speak to some of those points. So the, the uh, even before the pandemic, you know, when you look at Jewish life cycle rituals, there's a lot of them from birth to our weddings. The, the life cycle ceremony in a rabbi's manual after a wedding, the next one is funeral, which is pretty ironic because I, God willing, I'm gonna live more, more time between now and between my wedding, my first wedding and um, my funeral than between when I was born and I was first married. 
Jewish tradition teaches us that divinity, however we understand it, is present at any moment in our lives. And it's up to us to acknowledge God's presence. We do it by saying blessings, 100 blessings a day. 100 times we stop and say, wow, you know, 100 times we recognize what we're grateful for. Or we, uh, you know, recognize what is challenging to us. We do that through blessings and we do that through life cycle ceremonies. So one of the questions for this stage of life is, what are those moments in this stage of life for which we ought to be creating ritual? The fact that the tradition doesn't have them doesn't mean that they're not real. One of the things that we learned from the feminist movement uh, in the 70s was my experience is Jewish experience. The fact that the tradition didn't see me in that way, it's not, that's not the issue. And so women and now men created all kinds of new rituals that acknowledged women's experience as part of Jewish experience. So we learn from that, what are the moments in our life? So back to the chat, think for a moment about important moments in your life at this stage where you could imagine there would be benefit by having some kind of ritual. What we do in the book is not script the rituals. What we do is ask that question suggest 10 different moments when there might be a, um, an opportunity to create ritual and then talk about what are the tools? How do you think about Jewish traditions? How might you use Havdalah, for example, as a um, moment when you might create a ritual for um, something that has to do with separation of you know, a young adult going off to whatever the next stage of his or her life is. Um, I want to read just one quick section from the book that describes what I'm talking about. Um, saying goodbye to the house where you raised your children isn't easy, but it's easier if you actually say goodbye. Our daughter, her boyfriend, my husband, and I walked through the rooms of our home, stopping in each one to share good memories and to honor the room for its service. After our journey through time, space, and love, we shed a few tears, toasted the house, and sent it on its way to shelter and protect a new family. Before this ritual, we were stuck, painfully holding on to the house we had built 27 years before when our daughter was born. But after the ritual, we felt joy and contentment as we realized how rich those years had been and how ready we were to let go and move on. An unforeseen benefit is that our daughter's boyfriend now feels more comfortable, more connected to the life and history of our family and says that he can't wait to be part of the new memories we make together in our condo. We can't wait either. And linking that to your question, not very long ago, I officiated at a wedding of that young man and that daughter in the condo of the woman who wrote that article. It was supposed to be a big wedding and on a map or whatever, and it instead was in the condo, socially distant. Um, you make accommodations uh, when you can't be together in the way you originally planned. I know that you have explored um, services on uh, Zoom and you know they're not what they are when you can be together, but there's some ways in which they're actually quite powerful. And all of us have been to brisses and weddings and uh, um, alternative ceremonies. A, a friend uh, recently uh, turned uh, 60 and wanted to create a, el you know, a ceremony of becoming an elder and it was on Zoom and people prepared for it and it was thoughtful. And um, you know, we learned that uh, it takes 10 people to uh, make a minion. Well, it turns out, at least for some of us, that uh, you don't have to be physically in the same place. Mm -hmm. The presence of divinity is with us, even, uh, even over technology. Right, I've heard stories of people who have had, you know, were planning weddings um, for themselves or their children that had started out with, you know, 150 people and ended up with eight <laughs> and found that, you know, they were, in some ways more moving, more meaningful. Um, there were other ways to bring people in and make them part of it. But I love the adaptability and also the creation of new rituals that reflect the times that we're living in. So that's I do think that when this pandemic is over and it will be at some point, 
what kind of hybrid Jewish experience uh, emerges out of it. I don't think we're ever going to go back to a time when some notion of uh, being connected uh, virtually isn't part of our lives because for so many people, it turns out it's hard to get to show, right? And to be able to get to show by staying at home, it's going to require a lot of creativity and thoughtfulness, but we're good at this, right? I mean, the temple was destroyed, right? And here we are still being Jews. So um, we're going to continue to evolve what synagogues mean and what community means in, in, the, in this stage going forward. Mm. Well, that's great. Um, unfortunately, I wish we had more time, but we actually have a number of questions coming from the community and I want to give people a chance. Um, to have you respond to some of those. I'm going to start with one of them that, that I love that came in a little earlier um, on a lighter note, maybe not. Why do we get more irritable and less flexible as we age? So this is an interesting question. I'm not sure that we, we necessarily do. Um, one of the questions that emerged in our listening campaign was, how do I become the 90 year old that I someday uh, would like to be? Uh, you know, uh, the, when Harry met Sally and Estelle Reiner says, I want what she's having, right? All of us know some people who are in an age cohort that is older than we, how do, how do I get to be like them? What do I need to do now? And it turns out the Jewish tradition gives us certain spiritual tools. One of them is Musar, the, um, um, uh, tradition, the um, uh, spiritual practice of working on ourselves and um, working on certain kinds of character traits. A lot of the literature about growing older says that the things that we need to do in order to age well are to be more grateful, to be more forgiving, to have more equanimity, and there's a whole other list of things, but honestly, it's primarily forgiveness, mm -hmm. gratitude, and compassion. And it turns out that you can actually work on that. So I don't think getting older means you get more grouchy. Some people do, but I think other people who are thoughtful about who they want to be as they grow older and begin to do the work. And there are plenty of uh, synagogues, you guys might have done it uh, you know, in yours, you know, who have Musar groups um, that actually help people develop those kinds of um, muscles uh, that help them um, age uh, with more gratitude, with more joy, with more resilience. And the other thing about getting older is that, um, you know, we've been through tough stuff before. I mean, this, what we're going through now is just horrible. And at the same time, we know that we're gonna, there will be a time when this is over or that, that this is different. And you know, the, the optimism of that, um, you know, is an important, uh, is an important part of getting good at getting older. And also the recognition that it's on us to make some of these changes, both individually and also politically. Do you have any thoughts about um, what kinds of things in particular, meditation, maybe consultation uh, with spiritual leaders, uh, to facilitate some of that opening up and to allow people maybe to let go of path. You talk about forgiveness, maybe reconciling with a family member. What, what do you recommend? So again, the book does speak about these spiritual practices. The article by Sylvia Borstein about meditation. There's an article by Merle Feld about journaling. There's an interesting article by Vanessa Oakes about spiritual pilgrimage. So we're not traveling now, but someday we will again. There's an interesting article by Tiffany Schlein about a tech Shabbat. What does it mean to once a week just, you know, disconnect? And I think about that a lot now with all of the noise about the election and how, you know, at least for some of us, it's too much and, you know, you need to take a break. Um, so uh, there are those spiritual tools. Another spiritual tool that maybe you know about is the Institute for Jewish Spirituality, where I learned a lot of uh, what I was able to write about in the book. The Institute for Jewish Spirituality is open to anybody. They have a regular sit 
um, um, Monday through Friday. Uh, you can just sign on. When it started, uh, like in March, when the pandemic began, there were 30 people on the call. And now there are probably 500 people on the call. And you just go and sit. And there's a rabbi or cantor or a layperson who offers a you know short intention or a word of Torah, and then you sit and it's extremely powerful. So there are these tools out there. I'm sure that Rabbi Pedenser knows of many. I mean, I know because we're on all these same calls together, but you know, they're open to everybody. You don't have to be a rabbi. You only have to be a curious, thoughtful person who wants to discover what Jewish tradition um, you know, has to offer. I mean, it's stunning the, uh, the resources and the gifts that are out there that we could all uh, access. Hmm. Another question that came through when you were talking about ethical wills and um, a number of people were wondering if you have any resources uh, to help people create an ethical will beyond the book, which I know is for everybody, I'm telling you the book is full of these resources and really a wonderful um, source for all of this information in greater detail, but um, how do people go about creating their ethical will? Who should they consult? First of all, you should read the chapter in the book because it's quite specific about how to do it. And then there are resources. There's the classic book by uh, um, Rabbi Reamer called uh, So That Your Values Live On, uh, which is a kind of compendium of uh, ethical wills throughout our history. Fascinating documents that teach us a lot about what life was like in different times and places, and then gives you very specific instruction about how to do it. Then there's a newer book by uh, Ilana um, Zayman, I think, um, called uh, The Forever Letter, which is another um, you know, tool. These are easy, easy to get. You can also, you know, it, this started in Judaism, but now lots of other religious traditions are encouraging uh, ethical wills and secular people as well. So you can go to ethicalwill.com and see a whole lot of resources online. Or you can encourage your synagogue to create a workshop to uh, write an ethical will. And um, it's really hard to do because you don't want to do it. And one of the things that does work is to have an accountability buddy um, so that, you know, I say to you, Heidi, I want to do this. Um, and we agree that, you know, we're going to meet once a month and we're going to talk about it. And uh, maybe I'm going to share it with you or maybe I'm not, but at least I'm going to say, you know, I wrote it. Um, the other thing about an ethical will is we assume that it's something that we will give to our loved ones after we're dead. But when you think about new ritual, one of the possibilities is that you write this and you offer it to the people that you love while you're still alive. And um, that's a gift. Um, so uh, that's also a way to think about an ethical will and so that your values live on. That's a, a great idea, Barbara, Rabbi Pensner. I hope you're taking notes. <laughs> um, so we have to wrap up, but I know that you had some thoughts that you wanted to leave us with. And um, so I'll, I'll give you the floor for the, some final comments. So I want to um, say at the end that um, Getting Good at Getting Older, it's not a book that you read from beginning to end, but it's a resource that can help you think about a particular issue when it comes up in your life. And um, you all are experts at this. You know what those issues are because you're living with them and how each of us respond actually matters. I said in my talk that, you know, to say that 70 is the new 50 is a kind of internalized ageism. The bottom line is 70 is the new 70. We're doing it differently. And how we do it is gonna make a big difference to those that come after us. Many of you know that this last week's story portion, the one we read yesterday uh, in Shul, um, in our virtual shows, is the story of where the Jewish people begin with words uh, from the book of Genesis and Yud Hey Vav Hey said to Avram Lech Lecha, go, really go from your land, from your birthplace, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. 
I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I want to remind each one of you that Avram and Sarai were not millennials. They were like us, seasoned adults who were still fruitful in the fullness of age. They heard an invitation to explore their next stage. And that certainly led to blessing. So my prayer for all of you is that we hear the invitation at this stage of our life and each of us become that blessing for ourselves, for our synagogue, for our whole community, and for this very broken world that we need to be part of healing. So thank you so much for inviting me into your synagogue. And I look forward to meeting you when I uh, come to Boston, which God willing will someday be soon. Amen, amen. I am so moved by that conversation that just happened and want to point out, we talked about um, Lech Lecha and going forth and Rabbi Laura Geller was a pioneer when she went forth as an early rabbi. And now here she is leading us again, not only in helping us think through these important issues that so many of us have been avoiding and yet we know we need to do. And also just look at what we've created here today. You know, how quickly many of us have adapted to this new technology and how it's given us the gift of having a speaker who would not have flown here from LA for the Alan Waters lecture, and we wouldn't have had this opportunity to have family and friends from all over, and then to have the promise that this conversation isn't over and that we could bring Rabbi Geller back we could create a workshop for creating ethical wills. We could continue our Musar practice. Uh, you could be in, I can put people in touch with the Institute for Jewish Spirituality. I, I'm so moved by the connections that have started out of this conversation. I wanna thank Rabbi Geller. I wanna thank Heidi. And most importantly, the pioneer who started this all, I wanna thank Paula Dress Waters for her pioneering work throughout her life. And we are here, we're going to say goodbye to our guests and bring Paula back so that we can share some time together. Those who would like to stay and raise a glass, celebrate Paula, remember Alan, share stories. You're all welcome to stay. Otherwise I'll say, may we have better days ahead. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. So we'll turn this over to Paula. Ayla, do you want to open it up so everyone can see each other? Wow. Okay, Paula, it's all yours. Okay. Um, I'm not sure I have a script for this part. <laughs> Um, open to ideas, uh, people who want to stay. And uh, so we get to stay in this space. Is that the, the idea? This is the kibitz section. Okay. <laughs> so I think Hannah's going to be very helpful. Right. Hannah's on hand, and Ayla and Benita are also on hand. So you are not alone in this, Paula. Okay, great. Well, one thing I remember um, thinking about is that. Um, Toward the end of Alan's life, um, he uh, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my thread. Hannah, help me out here. <laughs> oh, you were um, you were just saying something about the end of Alan's life. Did you, did you want to talk more about that or did you yeah, want to I, well, I wanted to add something to it? And it was really in terms of the, you know, what a great congregation this is. And um, I remember that after he passed, um, he was taken to the, uh, the uh, what's the name of the organization? It's, it's the, um, right here, uh, at the Stanetsky um, Memorial Chapel in Brookline. And um, 
I know that uh, three people from the congregation showed up at different times to sing to him. I was very touched by that. And um, I talked to Jan Green about it. I hope she's still here because uh, she was one of the ones that I knew who did that, but I don't know who the other two were. So if anyone here <laughs> was involved in that, I would just love to know who, who you are. Uh, I was one, but I don't remember it as singing. I remember it as my introduction to the practice of accompanying the body. Mm -hmm. And I actually was kind of surprised when I got there and Alan wasn't in the room with me. Um, he was <laughs> somewhere else, but, but it was a practice of reading Psalms. So, and I don't remember how I knew what Psalm to read, who gave it to, I mean, that all has gotten faded away, but I have a vivid memory of signing up to do it, going and sitting and accompanying Alan. Mm -hmm. Isn't, well, isn't there a tradition in Judaism that you do not leave the body alone ever? Mm -hmm. Somebody is always with the person yeah. who's died. I, th I think Barbara could explain that. Yeah. So what you were doing was the mitzvah of Shmirah and Shmirah is guarding and that's exactly what that is, that in death and in life, no one wants to be alone. In fact, that's what funeral is in Hebrew is accompanying, levaya. So we don't always practice this idea of Shmira, but I can tell you that it's become um, more available and Ruth Letterman can actually speak to this, that we now have a community, Hebra Kadisha, which is made up of people from our broader community and not only a more traditional community and um, actually prepare bodies now for burial. It's a very loving task. I don't know if Ruth wants to talk about it, but Ideally, you can sign people up round the clock shifts if people are willing to do that. Just and if, or there is also the option of paying someone who sits there and reads Psalms. There's something very moving about giving that yourself. I don't know if Ruth Seidman might want to mention something about that as well. Well, um, when my husband died, uh, they asked me when I was making arrangements for the funeral, did I want that? And and then they asked, did I have someone in my community who would participate even for part of the time? They, I did not have to um, give them you know, the, for that entire time. Uh, and then they could arrange for the rest of the time. And I, um, I chose, and my, my rabbi was there when I was making the, these decisions. And um, of course I chose to um, uh, take, to, to take advantage of that. Um. Thank you, Ruth. That's good to know. And Diana, thank you for coming all the way from Ooh. Kansas to, be for it, to let us know about that. <laughs> wow. Yes, I, I, am I the one from Fathers to Way? No, I guess. Um... Oh, the, no, there's yes, Laura, Laura is from uh, Rabbi Geller is in California. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of people, including my daughter. <laughs> well, that's right. Hi, Anna. Hello. Well, I'm halfway across the country. Right. I'm in Kansas. So, mm -hmm. but it's interesting because um, I chose to move back out here in 2005 when I was 74 years old to move into a continuing care community. And that has brought me many new, new friends. Um, oh, and I remember how you, uh, when I was, um, I think it was uh, the Ernestine Rose book that I was uh, promoting at the time. Right. And you showed me all around Kansas and you know, we had a great time. Good. Jean. I can't help but say that as I was listening to the rabbi talk and seeing Diana and Paula together, as a younger woman, Paula, I and Diana, I came to you because I had met Tish age 19 when she was doing the older women's league. And we <laughs> created an intergenerational thing, Diana at that point, which was in the 80s, 
And now right. here I am, and I'm like a part of the elderly group with grandchildren and Ooh. children turning 50. <laughs> so I realize it's all turned around, but I'm delighted <laughs> to see you now as one of your peers and not as one of the younger ones. Well, except that I'm going, I'm getting close to the age of 90. And that's, that's another whole world. Yeah. Yeah. Judy, Judy Levine. Oh, is she? I was actually grasping toward the, the chat, but I do want to compliment both Rabbi Geller and Heidi on a beautifully done, touching, informative, um, talk and just throw my love to you, Paula. And mine to you. Somebody else want to? Yeah, can you? What's that person? You're muted. Jan, Jan, um, uh, remember when you told me um, that you were one of the ones who uh, went to this, uh, this, the, uh, um, the, the chapel, yeah, uh, and uh, and we're singing. So we found a few other people. <laughs> yes, and uh, I I don't think at that time I was aware of a tradition of reading psalms, but singing is what I do, yeah. and it felt like absolutely the right thing to do at that moment. Um, go ahead. So. I um, I, you know, I often think of Alan, who was a very good friend who died much too young. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of some of the things that was just discussed here, um, he was an expert about encore careers mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. use, you know, the use of his time in various voluntary uh, activities in which he planned out what was meaningful in different ways and what he could do. And he planned out his charitable giving. And um, he, I, I don't know that I've ever known anybody who was as good as this <laughs> as he was. And I often think about him when I'm thinking about these issues for myself. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah. I just sort of want to, I'm one of the Oboe's founders that we have long history. And this was just such a special thing in spirit of this to bring Alan, Alan's spirit so vitally here with us and to remember it. And I also was very inspired by the work that Paula and Diana did on their Women Growing Older one and have been involved in aging issues. And I just think this, Laura, get Rabbi Geller, I mean, it was just beautiful how you articulated all the vital issues that we are all grappling with now. And it should be part of the normal conversations of life. And I thank you for your contribution and that wonderful book you did. So. Paula, I want to thank you also for doing this wonderful gathering and bringing back such a flood of memories about Alan and Alan and you. And I was reminded of the time that Irv and I first met Alan and he was so worried that he wasn't going to be good enough for you. He had to call him personally. It was um, really interesting how uh, protective we were of you. But Alan turned out to be one of the most extraordinary men I've ever met. And even before you got married, we were playing sonatas together. And I was thinking, right. oh my God, what a wonderful match for Paula. And so happy that he came into your life. And I love seeing all these familiar faces in the Zoom today, people who all adored Alan, adore you. And it's just so special to be able to remember him like this and to have such a wonderful topic. I thought Rabbi Geller was wonderful and it gave us a lot of food for thought. And um, anyway, I look forward to seeing you again soon, which won't be that long, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Judy, that's very sweet. He never told me that he was worried about <laughs> of not being able to, <laughs> that's funny. Anyway, 
Judy Levine. What happened? <laughs> I was still <laughs> just gonna wave <laughs> to uh, Diana. That's all. <laughs> no further comments. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, this is Anne. I just want to send you a virtual hug. Um, that's one thing I miss about being, you know, being able to hear one of these lectures in person. But from afar, I'm just going to send you um, a hug from both Susan and me. Oh, my goodness. Here is Jane Sajowski. She rescued me from having to take uh, bring food home from <laughs> the Stara Market here, and we became friends over um, various things. And she's actually here. That's amazing. Yes, I was able to to hear your um, your talk at the beginning and be on most of it, and or or skip the middle part. But I've been on listening to all of the tributes of all of these amazing people. My new mishpucha. Um, about about your life and and their lives and the joys of of the people in them and art and music and thinking and active being activist it's it's really just so inspiring so I um, I'm just filled with with such gratitude that that we met Paula and to everybody on this call just what a lovely lovely group of people. No, thank you, and I hope we'll meet again. <laughs> we will. You're here. So here we have Wendy Sanford, whose name was mentioned in the talk. Did you wanted to say something, Wendy? Hi, Paula. Well, it's so interesting when Judy was remembering Alan. Well, I um, one of the things, wonderful things she didn't mention was what a um, what a what a wonderful romance you had. You no, know, it, 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 you met a really sy sympathetic person, but you also just fell madly in love and had a fabulous time doing so many things together. And I always loved that about you too. Thank you, Wendy. I see uh, there's a picture of Alan's daughter. Uh, I don't know if that means she's behind the picture or she's for us to enjoy, but she's right under Wendy. <laughs> I'm here, Paula. I turned the um, the sound oh, of the video off. Where are you, honey? I turned oh, the video Susan. off. Yeah, it's it's a little crazy. My house is a lot of dog barking, so I wrote a few things in the chat. Oh, good. I look for them. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> no. There, here we have uh, some old friends from years ago who uh, showed up here, um, Bill and Ellen Dorsch, um, from all the way down from Vermont, unless they've moved since last. Ellen, are you saying so? Well, glad you came anyway. Thank you. Oh, ask to unmute. Yeah, I'm doing that. Oh. <laughs> okay. I'm trying anyway. Bill, we can't hear you. Can you unmute? Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay, good. I was going to say that, remind Paula that our friendship goes back uh, initially to Arlington, Massachusetts on Everett Street. And uh, we got to know Hannah in utero at that point. <laughs> and, that was my best phase. Uh, this is actually the first time we joined in, in one of these um, lectures or talks because we never knew about them. So I really appreciated your letting us know about it. I really appreciated what the rabbi had to say and the back and forth was very, very uh, helpful and moving. And I want to just say that uh, Alan's entry into your life was uh, a blessing for all of us. So um, even though we haven't joined these talks before, uh, that does not mean I haven't thought of Alan over the years 
And Paula, uh, Alan and I never figured out whether you could gain more than a pound if you <laughs> ate a pound of chocolate. And we worked on that for an entire weekend. And mm -hmm. you, you, I don't know if you call that, but that was a weekend that Alan and I kept discussing this issue. And um, he probably has worked it out by now. I want to chime in on that. I just didn't get it. If you, so if you eat a pound of feathers as opposed to a pound of chocolate, you, do you still just gain a pound? How we spent a whole weekend on that, I'm not sure. But following up on what, um, Wendy, Wendy Sanford? Yes, yeah. what Wendy yeah. said um, about your romance at beginnings. We had the most wonderful times when you two would come up here for weekends. And we live in a beautiful spot on the lake. And I'm sure it's very romantic, but we live here. But they enjoyed it so much that we just saw where we lived in a different way whenever they came up and spent time with us. And we've been really remiss. We haven't been seeing a lot of Paula, but this afternoon together is going to change things. Thank you so much, Paula. Oh, thank you both very much. I'm so glad. We, in, we intended to see you this last spring, but something weird happened exactly. and we couldn't do it. Yeah, it's it's hard. And, you know, I don't have a car anymore. And it's hard to get around to different places. But there may be other little events like this, perhaps, where we can, you know, meet at the same event and share an experience. Very nice. Something to think about. Yep. <laughs> okay. And Hannah, it's wonderful seeing you. Thank you. Totally, totally, totally. totally pivotal childhood experiences. My <laughs> first zip slide, for example. Well, actually, she's not still in utero. Your daughter had already she's made little, some kind of uh, an appearance, but Hannah was still in utero, and um, that's amazing. I mean, to have friends that remember when your child was born and all of that. Well, just one other quick memory about Hannah and one of your visits. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was political even when she was young. And she was with our kids back in where the kids were playing. And she came out with a sign she, she made and she said, what was it, don't? Hey, hey smoker, ever hear of cancer? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, was, <laughs> she was a little old. Oh, right. Do you remember that, Hannah? I, I was actually thinking about that a couple of months ago, <laughs> remembering that, and, and I thought, well, who was smoking? <laughs> you know, none of us smoked. So, <laughs> okay, well, that's enough for Vermont. No, but I think some people were, and she made a little sign. Do you remember the sign? Yes, yeah. <laughs> actually, I have one other thing. Hannah, what did you think we were smoking? I have no idea. I don't really remember this. <laughs> She's very pure. She doesn't do those things. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, wow. Other folks want to share? I put something in the chat. Um, I don't know if everybody can read the chat just about what I, you know, was just really inspired by the. Um, parallel and the really like deep egalitarian romance between Ernestine Rose and William, her husband. Oh yeah. In the 1800s. Um, and that was, uh, you know, work that Paula was doing and Alan was really committed to enabling. They traveled to England together and they did all this research and library work together and um, just, but it, what was so cool is that that relationship was just so parallel to their relationship. Mm -hmm. That was just so mutual in that way, which, you know, I wish more relationships were like that. Well, you know, it's a sad thing is that when, um, by the time the book was published and ready to bring around, that was after the time that Alan passed. So, um, yeah, I had to come to California on my own and hang out with you guys and with um, some of the people who lived in that area. But 
Yeah, he, but he was a tremendous, I mean, he was also, he had plenty of work to do and stuff, but he was so uh, always interested in helping. He loved helping people. I think he helped it more. He liked it more than, you know, having a lot of fame about this or that. There's something very special about him. So, Paula, I could share the two of the memories I wrote to you privately just now. Would that be okay? Sure. Because one, sure. <laughs> one of them is another side to, to Alan that I had heard about. But, but first, the, um, so we were all in an adult B'nai Mitzvah class, the first one of Temple Halel B'nai Torah. And Paula said she wasn't real happy about Alan um, listening to her practicing and because he could be critical. And I didn't really understand that because my experience of Alan was he was very loving and warm and supportive and pleasant and, you know, just, I had never seen him a critical word until the day we were up on the, the Bima practicing and Paula was doing whatever she was doing. And Alan was standing behind her, clutching his hands like this. And I went, Oh, that's what Paul is talking about. So okay. I go, hmm, that's interesting. And um, but the other thing was after that was the summer before he died. And um, I had offered to, so you know, I'm into gardening, and I'd offered to um, help with their redo their garden. And he was very into it. He and Paula, you know, carefully thought, you know, I said, here, you know, here's some possibilities, and they came over to see my garden and said, well, we like this rather than the way you do that. And he was very present participating, even when he was, you know, I mean, we, I don't, I don't think I knew how ill he was, but he was so present in the, the placing and the choosing and what, what was going to be beautiful to him. And that's one of my, along with the Reb Allen memory and the one I wrote about earlier in the chat are my, some of my favorite memories of Allen. So. Well, you know what, Claudia, I think I was very self-conscious about my singing ability at the time. I think I've improved a bit over some period of time, but I think that's what the issue was. Um, whereas gardening, you know, we were both equally, um, you know, we weren't great gardeners or anything, but we could we could do that together, that worked. I think that the other side of that piece about the singing is that um, Alan was really reflective about if something wasn't working as he expected it to, he was very thoughtful about what was causing the thing and how to how to correct it or, or improve it or whatever. So I also feel like he really supportively, um, uh, you know, supported um, uh, your singing, Ram. Like he, he helped you kind of identify ways to improve. Well, I have to say also that my since having Rabbi Barbara for, um, you know, a leader of our temple that I've become a little more comfortable about singing. Um, so I want to appreciate her for that. Uh, among just, many other things. This is Susie again. Um, I Thank just you. have to cheer, I have to chip in there. Um, because I remember very poignantly a time where <clears throat> I confessed to my dad that I was very concerned about my older daughter and that she didn't sing on pitch and that I thought she was tone deaf. Oh, are you kidding? And, no, and, and he, said, he said, no, Susie, you need to not worry about it. It's, it's her range, she's too young, she can't hit the notes. And now she is the most amazing singer. And the fact, the fact that I ever questioned that is, <laughs> is hilarious, but he knew. Awesome. He knew it. That's so cool. Well, it was <laughs> Great. Well, I think we should let everybody uh, go home, right? I well, I was just, I just want to say one more thing. And that is that all of those Passover seders at your house were among my very, very happiest memories. Um, the way in which you opened your home and 
had so many of us there from from different parts of your life and the collective members and um, those were wonderful satyrs among my very favorite memories and and Alan was a marvelous host just marvelous thank you Diana good to hear miss you all very much miss you too Diana I, I used to say come on out to Kansas and a few of you did <laughs> all of did thank goodness <laughs> A few of my That's other friends the next came couple out. Of days, Diana. <laughs> what, Anna? I think it's very tempting to come to Kansas over the next couple of days. Yeah, well, <laughs> 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 no, no, you won't. Um, it's going to be peaceful here, but you're not going to like the outcome of our election in Kansas. Oh, but. sorry. I've been throwing money in your direction. <laughs> well, to Barbara? Yes. To Barbara Bollier. Well, she stands a chance, so I hope. We'll see. Hmm. Yeah. Well, before we wrap up, does anybody else have anything final to say? And then maybe Paula, you should have the last word. Uh, well, hold on. Any takers before Paula has the last word? Greetings to Emily. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, then I'm going to uh, pass it off to Paula. Well, um, <laughs> thank you all. This has been very wonderful. And um, perhaps Rabbi Barber has a, a closing uh, statement. That's really generous of you, Paula. Um, you know, given that Hannah mentioned the election and um, and Diana, I am. I grew up in Kansas, so I'm a big fan of Sharice David, who represents. Where? Where John, in Kansas? Diana. I grew up in um, Overland Park, and my parents. Oh. Okay. Leeward. So Sharice David's is somebody we right. She's the rep. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> as we as we enter into these couple of days, I want to say what a wonderful respite it has been for these couple of hours to be connected to people who are caring and loving and intentional and purposeful in your lives. And Paula, you have been a leader and a mentor and a teacher and a friend to so many. And we pray for um, many, many years of your wisdom and your love and that Hannah will get to see you and Emily and Abe again sometime soon here. May we get through this time, as those before us have gotten through this time, whether in Jewish history or even in American history, democracy has survived and we will make it so. So I wish you all the best in the next couple of days and I hope to see you soon. And thank you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody. It was such a beautiful gift to see everybody and what a wonderful event. Thanks, Paula and Rabbi, for making this happen. Thank you, everyone. We need it. Thanks, Alia. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.